Let's go to California and speak to Catherine Stoner, who is the Mossbacher Director and Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Center on Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law. Catherine, thank you so much indeed for joining us. Um, at the International Court of Justice, Ukraine has taken out a case against Russia. Uh, how difficult is it to prove the prosecutor there at the ICJ is investigating, but how difficult is it to prove and then prosecute possible war crimes? Uh, well, it'll take a long time, of course, and, and um, you know, it, it is very difficult in a situation with uh, with someone like Vladimir Putin, which, and that is who my understanding is they intend to um, uh, investigate in particular, but I suppose also they will investigate the individual uh, members of the Russian military who uh, perpetrated um, these acts uh, in Ukraine on civilians. Um, but the issue here is time, of course, and and um, then there's also the the issue of uh, actually extracting Mr. Putin and other perpetrators um, from Russia someday. So it, it, it seems uh, as though it will be kind of a hollow justice for um, for the victims of of these attacks. What do you make of these four demands that the Russians have for an immediate ceasefire? I mean, the demands being made of Ukraine. Apart from acknowledging Crimea, which was illegally annexed, as we know, in 2014, apart from acknowledging that territory as now Russian territory and then the independence of those two breakaway republics in the east, there's this legal issue here, surely, about demanding that Ukraine change its constitution to become a neutral country. Has that ever happened before, as far as you know, that an invading nation demanding legally a change of a constitution of the country that it's attacking? I can't think offhand other other than you know situations in in the Second World War, of course, um, but they were in the, you know uh, the Sudetenland, Poland, they were effectively annexed. Same with um, uh, Austria. So uh, no, um, but it, in the Ukrainian Constitution is the aspiration um, to to join uh, NATO um, and. Uh, anyway, to you know, to directly answer your question, no, I think it's very unlikely, um, pretty much impossible for any uh, elected Ukrainian president uh, like Mr. Zelensky to accept um, these demands. Um, he wouldn't survive a day in office um, if he did. Um, this is not something Ukrainian people are, are willing to accept. And, you know, if Putin's goal here was to keep Ukraine permanently out of NATO and out of the European Union, well, he's just done a wonderful job of, of state building here in, in terms of uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians being, as what we're seeing in polling uh, now, even more intent on joining NATO. Um, and we can see, obviously, on the ground every day in the images you're showing why they would want to do that. They they have a neighbor that that you know is run by a, a group of people who clearly don't think they have a right to exist as a state. Um, and that's the crux of the issue. The other issue here is, and do you think it's actually a distraction that Putin has thrown out there, his apparent concern of NATO's expansion eastwards? I mean, admittedly, it's a fact that since the collapse of the Soviet Union, many more Eastern European countries have become a member of that military alliance. But is it a distraction? Is it actually more yeah. the case that Putin may be worried about democracy clo so close to his country's borders? and also the future of Russian speakers in territories close to Russia's borders. Yeah, so I, I think it's, it's more the former than the latter, um, because nothing bad was happening to um, Russian speakers in territories close to Russian borders. That was true in Georgia in 2008. It was true in Ukraine in 2014. And it's true today, of course. There was no genocide being perpetrated on Russian speakers in Ukraine that was manufactured as an excuse uh, by Mr. Putin to try and get support from his own people for, you know, uh, uh, annexing and, and uh, effectively the Donbass region uh, of Ukraine. In terms of NATO expansion, sure, NATO expansion did happen, but the last uh, expansion to Russian borders uh, was in 2004. So to use that as a pretext in, in 2014 and now in 2022 for military action against Ukraine strikes me at least as absurd. Now, you, now NATO has expanded 
um, beyond that. Um, but in you know the most recent member was North Macedonia, um, which w was in 2020. And and you know if anything that weakens NATO because really I don't know about the Turkish people, but the American people I can say pretty confidently. Um, would not go to war for North Macedonia. Um, and and so, you know, the worry would be that the Article 5 commitment, which says a war on one is, you know, an attack on one member is an attack on all, um, is really diluted in, in a case like that. Um, so this is a pretext. And as you said, yes, this is more about first Ukraine being a democracy and looking for its future to the West not to Russia. And you can see, even as you, Ukrainians are fleeing, unfortunately, now under this savage um, attack, they're, they're not go through, going through the pur purportedly safe humanitarian corridors um, that have been created to Russia or Belarus. They want to go west to Poland or to Hungary or to Romania um, in, and even through Moldova. So I think that tells you something, too. This is all about a demonstration effect. Um, for uh, Russia and, and fear also on the part of Mr. Putin that Russians themselves will look at a successful democratic Ukraine and say, why can't we have that? And that for him is an existential threat. And so that's really what this is about. And then he has a strange idea about Russian and Ukrainian history where he doesn't see them as different people. Um, but the problem here is that that factually speaking, they are. Um, and even the Ukrainian language is different. Um, to some degree, religion is different. There are also Catholics and Orthodox Christians in Ukraine. And, and finally, and most importantly, you know, Ukraine has been a sovereign, independent country since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. And yep. in 1994, yep. You know, Russia agreed to respect that sovereignty in exchange for the the, yeah. um, the legacy yeah. nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Catherine Stoner, really appreciate it. Thank you so much indeed. Catherine Stoner from Stanford University. That's it. For